Okay, none of these doors work. Okay, I'm going to get started. Um, my understanding is that someone's recording this, so that's why I've got the microphone on, so just let me know if you're struggling to hear me. Um, is everyone in the room an engineer? Are we looking at engineers? No, okay, let's have a show of hands. Engineers? Oh, quite a lot, okay. Business, science, law. Okay, we've got a bit of a mixture. Um, so my name's Catherine Kelly. I work at the Career Centre just one day a week. Um, I'm doing a PhD actually at the university, but in a previous life I worked in finance, so I started my career in the UK. You can probably tell that I'm Scottish, so if you struggle with the accent, please don't be afraid to ask. Um, I went to work for Deloitte and worked for them for about six years, did a lot of graduate recruitment and assessment centres, Went on to work for a couple of US corporations and again did a lot of recruitment, worked with a lot of recruiters. So I used that experience at the Career Centre to help graduates primarily with graduate applications, internship applications. And that can be doing a resume, doing a cover letter, doing the online application questions and the selection criteria, or just preparing for an interview and in assessment centre um, techniques. So the Career Centre has numerous services. That you, can, uh, elite, that you can take advantage of. So um, most of the time I do do workshops, but I also do one-on-one -on -one appointments. So if you have specific applications that you would like reviewed, then those are, that service is there and you can bring specific application documents to be reviewed either by myself or by one of the other careers counsellors there. Okay? Um, the first thing and the reason I give a bit about myself and my background is to understand that these are subjective documents. It is a subjective process recruiting people and you will get different advice from different people. That goes without saying. Um, what I try to do in these sessions is not give you a template that you can go away and fill in. I'm generally against that as a, as a method to do application documents, but instead give you the techniques to ask yourself about your own skills and your own experience and the type of profession that you want to go into to start to build your own documents. And I very much am of the skill of thought that you are the best person to do that. You know, there are services out there you can pay to get these things done, but you will set yourself up much better for the whole process if you really do the hard work at the start. If you do the hard work on the resume and the cover letter and the online application questions, when you come to assessment centres and interviews, you'll be much better equipped to deal with those questions. Okay? Um, I generally just use pen, um, but since it's quite a big room, I'll use both today. Um, everything that I put up, so everyone will get a copy of the workshop pack, everyone will get some documents on cover letters, that, so templates and information on how to do a, um, a cover letter document, and a resume template, albeit that I'm not a huge fan of them. Okay, so you'll get all of that um, if you sign the register, which is coming around. Okay? 
Um, okay, so please interact because resumes and cover letters are not the most exciting <laughs> subject for anyone, right? So how long do you think um, someone's going to look at your resume for? Who's spoke? 30 seconds? Uh, any advance on 30? Anyone think they're worth more than 30 seconds of someone's time? No? Good, because uh, it's actually less than about 30. It's probably 10 to 20 seconds. Now, that doesn't mean that um, you can't you know, pay attention to the detail. Okay? Think about the process. Put yourself in their shoes. Most of the people that review graduate applications in particular, it's not their day job. They're usually managers from within the business. Um, they're usually confronted with a huge stack of applications. Um, they only have a small amount of time to do that. And the first and most human thing to do is just try to reduce the number you have to review. Okay, and that's the 10 to 20 second review. So I would always start with the documents and I'd go, yes, no, maybe, yes, no, maybe. Okay? Now, what you want is to get into that yes pile and then someone will come back and they will spend longer on your application. Okay, so they will still look at the detail. The detail is still important. But now they're doing it with a much smaller group of applications. Okay, but that first review is really important. And you've got to set up yourself and your resume and your cover letter documents to really send the message of that you have what they're looking for really quickly. Okay, so what do people generally look for at the graduate and, and the internship level? Does anyone have any ideas? It's really, it's not rocket science, right? It's easy stuff. Okay, so at a more experienced level, who's Googled how to do a resume? Anyone? Usually half the room has Googled how to do a resume. And that can be really misleading. And this all feeds into um, what you'll hear me say again and again for the next hour, which is you must get advice that is specific to your situation. Okay? And that is why you get different advice from different people. Because you're not asking specific enough questions of people. Okay, so you're getting a generic answer. And if you look on Google, you'll probably find resumes that are for experienced people. So you'll find resumes that are for CEOs, CFOs, senior managers, general managers. And they will tend to start with a good summary and a skills section. Okay, and if you have got experience, that's absolutely how your resume should start. But at the graduate level, that is not what you're selling. Okay, at the graduate level, People generally are less interested in what you think you can do, and they're more interested in what you have done. Okay? So, key things. You must, they must see your education. They must see any relevant experience, internship experience, anything that you feel relates to the profession that you're going into. They must be able to find extracurricular, and they must be able to find part-time work. Okay? They're going to tick off those things in the back of their mind very quickly. And when they have a 10 to 20 second review, that is what they're looking for. Okay? Because almost every graduate employer across the board, across professions, are much more focused on they're going degree tick, but now I want to see what else you've done. I want to see what your transferable skills are. I want to see if you've got leadership and communication and you've got involved in something outside of your studies. Okay, so this is about format and how do you get that message across quickly and I'll try to touch on different people's situations. But the reality is if you haven't got those things, the most important thing you can do is to go and get as much experience as you can. Okay, because like I say, graduate re recruiters are preferentially looking for those transferable skills. Okay, so you must get advice that is specific to yourself. And you must make sure that you set yourself up so they can find those four key things quickly. All right? So it is a subjective process, but there are things that everyone agrees on. Okay? I call them the golden rules, but, you know, people will call them different things. And this is really across the board and across culture. So, you know, if you want to apply in China or the UK or Australia, you might find culturally there are different norms. But these things really cross boundary. And again, they're not rocket science, okay? So how long do you think your resume should be? Any ideas? One to two? Any advance on one to two? Yeah, so one to two is right now. And just to give you a feel for how quickly things change, I've been doing these workshops for about 18 months. And when I started, it was two to three. 
Okay? And that really emphasizes how important it is that even if you are Googling or you're finding information, you've got to make sure it's as current as possible and from the right sources. Okay? So one to two. And I do think over the next year that will start to move to one. Okay? If you're applying in North America, it is one. Absolutely. Okay? So Australia, one to two. See, this is from when I started the workshops. Okay, so one to two pages. How do you make your um, information stand out? It's all about the format. Okay, they want clean, concise format. Okay, black and white is fine. Don't feel the need to make it really colorful and pretty to stand out. They want simple. Uh, color is okay, but keep it dark. Most people still print in black and white, and so you know, all your effort is lost, right? So, Arial and Calibri are the two fonts that seem to be preferentially liked by recruiters. And I tend to use 10 or 11 point. I'll write a few of these points down. Okay. Um... So, like I said, black and white, nice and simple text. Um, you must, the, the format's important for two reasons. It's your first impression, absolutely. It's the first thing someone sees of you, but it's also how you make sure that it stands, that the key information stands out. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some key sections that should be in your resume, and we'll go through how to set up that format so that it jumps off the page. Okay? The next one is just grammar and spelling. Couldn't be easier. Okay? and yet everyone makes mistakes here. Okay, it just sets a really bad, it gives a really bad impression if you make any grammatical or spelling mistakes, because even if, you know, we know that everyone makes those mistakes, it means that you didn't check it, and it means you didn't ask anyone else to check it for you. So maybe you didn't take the application seriously. Okay, so do not make spelling and grammatical mistakes, and do give yourself the time to double check yourself or even get someone else to check it. And then the last and most important thing is that you must tailor your application. So you cannot have a one or two page resume that you're just going to send to everyone. That doesn't work anymore. So 10, 15 years ago when you prepared a five page resume that was exhaustive, yes, you just sent that maybe to every employer. That is not the case now. You know, people expect you to have tailored it for them. It's like a branding tool, okay? And this is again the common theme all the way through the session and it's really important to understand that if you and your friends come to see me you're applying for the same job but you have different experience the resume could look different because the way to sell an individual into a particular role is going to be different and dependent on their skills and experience okay and this is where it's really important that you don't just download a template and try to fill in the gaps okay really ask yourself what are they looking for what deserves to go on page one? What is kind of ancillary information I should be putting on page two? If I look right in the middle of page one, am I ticking most of their boxes? Okay, so it must be tailored both to the organization and to you. Okay? All right, dead easy. So let's just go through quickly the key sections in a resume. Okay, just yell out. What would you put in your resume? Anyone? Name. Well done. Contact details. Let's call it that. <laughs> okay. Why are we at university? Because we want an education. Yeah. Good. I'll give you a couple of the easy ones. References should go on the resume and at the bottom. Okay? And I've already given you the answers. They must be able to see your experience.
and they want to see your extracurricular and voluntary work. Okay? Now, skills. I've put this in a different colour because I'll come back to this. Skills, like I said, if you have more experience, um, really are, can be a significant part of the resume. Um, and they go up the top. And that's really just because if you've got 10 or 15 years of experience, how do you snapshot it for someone onto page one? Right? You need a way to do that. That's just not the case for graduates. And like I said, they're going to preferentially look for what you've done. So skills might or definitely will to an extent be on your resume. But depending on how much experience and extracurricular you have, the skills section could change quite significantly person to person. The ideal scenario is you've got plenty of experience, skills is small, it's a page two piece of information. But the less experience you have, the bigger that section's going to get, the closer it's going to move to the top of the resume. Okay? So we'll talk about that a little bit separately. Okay. A couple of other small things. How do you set yourself apart from other people? Well, you might have gone to conferences. There might be specific projects that you've done that are relevant to the career you want to go into. You might have publications if you have a research component to your degree. <coughs> um, you might have some awards, uh, memberships. Okay, now again, these things here, education, extracurricular, and uh, experience are where the money is, right? That's what they're looking for. Um, that doesn't mean you don't put these on, but if you have these, these become ancillary pieces of information. The less you have of these, I will be looking or challenging you to go through what you've studied at uni. Are there any major projects that you can use as experience where you can really talk about some analysis that you did or a report that you wrote? Have you been on field trips if you want to work out in regional areas and for mining companies, can you demonstrate you've been out in the field either to a conference or for some trip of some kind? So it's really your responsibility to go through as everything that you've done and ask yourself, can I add value to my application by really demonstrating something they're looking for with these? Okay? All right, we're going to go through these one by one. So what goes at the top? It's dead easy. Contact details goes right at the top. Okay. References go right at the bottom. I think it's about seven-ish. Okay. Seems easy, right? Contact details. What are you going to tell them? I only want to know your name, your email, your email, sorry, your email, your phone number, your address, a LinkedIn page if you have it. Ideally, you will have it and you will keep it up to date, but obviously don't put it on if it doesn't if it's not kept up to date and it doesn't look nice. Okay, citizenship or visa, yes, can go on there, but everything else, no. Okay, I don't want to know your age or your date of birth or your gender or your marital status or anything of the kind. Okay, these things, these many, many people come to see me with a huge amount of information in that personal information section and it's just completely unnecessary. Okay, so keep it nice and succinct. The other mistake I think people make is they give multiple emails and multiple phone numbers when I'm not going to call you three times, okay, and I'm not going to email you twice. Give the one phone number and the one email address that you check all the time, okay? Dead easy. Right at the bottom, references. So references generally are expected to be on the resume now. Um, I would say that is name, position, and employer. Okay, and then how do you get in touch with them? So I've just got it on this page if you want to take it down. Okay, now many people ask me again, what if I did an internship overseas? Can I use an international reference? And again, my attitude is yes, if that is your most recent, most relevant piece of experience, then absolutely you should put someone on. If they choose not to call them, that is fine but it adds credibility to your application if you're willing to give a reference from the most relevant experience that you've had. Okay, so generally don't be afraid of these things. You've had experience, it's good experience, it has value. Make sure you put someone down. All right? 
Okay, easy. Right, let's get on to the um, chunkier bits in the middle. And there's that. Okay. So you can see here, this is what we want to tell them about education. So education is going to go right up top underneath contact details. Now there are exceptions to that. Um, if this is not, if you haven't come through straight from school to university and this is the first time, it, and it's not the first time you're going out to market, then I think you have to start with a summary or career profile of some description. Okay? Because you've got to t start to tell the story of how you've come to want to go into the career you're going into now. But if this is the first time you're really going to market, you're going for a graduate job or an internship, then always start with your education. I noticed last week Woodside in particular asked for an objective, and obviously if they ask for one, give it to them. But I would say unless it asks, let it go and start with education. Okay? All right. So, I'm going to put this up. Okay, so you want to tell them the university, you want to tell them majors, you want to tell them your grades. Now, not everyone's going to want to do that, <laughs> okay? And it just goes without saying. If it is adding value to your application, then yes, it goes on, okay? And to me, adding value is just above the minimum requirement, okay? And this comes back to this point about who are they really looking for? They're looking for people who have a broad skill set. Okay, they will preferentially recruit someone with a slightly lower GPA but lots of extracurricular over someone with a slightly higher GPA but really hasn't done anything else. Okay, there's exceptions to every rule but I would say as a rule that is true. Okay, so as long as you've got the minimum requirement just put it on there. Um, if you don't and you still really want to apply then do it. Don't put it on here. Hope that by the time they get through all your online application questions and the resume and the cover letter and they get your transcript that they already love you. Okay? Now, awards. So, if you have awards from university, I would absolutely put them on. Um, I've specifically, you can see here, I've bolded the top line and I've bolded where I've written awards. And that's because this is how we get information to jump off the page. Okay? So, if the degree is the most important thing, make that the first line. If you feel like the university is, make that the first line. But just keep in the back of your mind, they've got key pieces of information they're looking for, they just want to grab it. And that's what you want to jump off the page. Okay? Now, with awards, <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, if you have just one award, then just put it here with your education and put a bold um, marker next to it. If you have multiple awards over the course of university, I would actually pull it out, create a whole new section called Awards and Achievements, put it straight underneath Education, and just bullet point them. And that's just because, again, they're not really going to read them all, but you're sending the message of Awards and Achievements, there's four bullet points, I'm pulling the first word that seems like they've performed above average. Okay? So by putting them together, you're kind of making them more prominent, you're making them stronger. Okay, but one or two, I would just keep them with the education or the experience that they relate to. Okay, but you must be consistent. Okay, so um, if you put GPA, I haven't written it here actually. If you put GPA and ATAR, then you must put ATAR and vice versa. If you put ATAR and don't put GPA, what do I think? I think there's a reason you haven't told me and it's when you've done well at school and you've dropped off a cliff. Um, I'll come to this. It's not necessary for everyone, but yes, I'll answer your question. Okay, so the key is be consistent, okay? If you put GPA, you must put ATAR and vice versa. Um, no one cares anymore about achievements and things from school, okay? So I really don't want to see extracurricular and awards and achievements from, you know, year 10, 11, and 12, okay? If you have achievements at university and you want to show that you have consistently a performed above average, then put one award from school and it needs to be a year 12 one, but that's it. And to answer your question more specifically, I would say if you have literally gone school, university, and you're just going straight out to market now, and you went to school in Perth, I would put it on just because sometimes it can be a point of conversation, okay? But anyone else, like anyone who left school pre-2011, kind of 2010, absolutely not, 
Okay? Okay. And to be honest, like once you get further down the track again, you know, you, you are still going to put your education, but your education drops right down to the bottom of the resume because it's no longer the key thing you're selling and the whole section becomes much smaller. But graduate internship level, right at the top, make sure they can pull the key information out really quickly. Uh, lots of people come to me and they've done this. Okay, and then they've got an award here and a GPA maybe here. What's wrong with this? It's really hard. I mean, if you write like this and you go uni, degree, GPA, majors, award, okay, how do people read? They read down the left-hand side, okay? They're probably not going to even read that, okay? So you must always think you want your key information to pop out down the left-hand side, okay? And that is why I've always put my dates on the right-hand side, okay? So all the way through the document, information on the left, dates on the right, line the dates up, okay? Dates are something I want to be able to grab easily, okay? But if I run my eye down the left-hand side of the page, as we all do when we read, then I want to find degree, position, who you worked for, what extracurricular, I don't want to find, you know, June 2016. All right? Okay. So, really think about format. Yeah. I'm going to just rub this out. Okay, let's just go on to experience. So, what would we tell them about experience? Well, what constitutes experience? Let's do this first. So I purposely called it this when we did the initial um, mind map, if that's what it can be called. Because um, this really falls into two categories for most graduates, okay? You've got your relevant experience, and that can take the form of um, actual you know, internships, or it can just be that you've managed to pick up some part-time relevant work, okay? But You've got relevant experience, and then you're going to have probably some kind of part-time experience. Okay? Now, um, just, you know, based on what we've gone over already, within any section, the information must be in reverse chronological order. Okay? Must be. Now, if you did an internship over the summer, but right now through semester, you work for Domino's, then what's going to go at the top? you have one section for work. You're going to have to put dominoes, right? And that's not what you want. Okay, so we come back to, we want them to be able to find those key internships, key pieces of information quickly. Okay, so after education, I would go to this. And if, if you have relevant experience, I would create a new section and call it relevant experience or call it internships. Something that makes sense where you only deal with those key things that are kind of tick the box items for the employer. Okay? I would then go to extracurricular. Because again, employers are preferentially going to look for how involved have you been. It doesn't have to be on campus. It can be in your community. It can be with a charity that you particularly care about. But they are looking for it. Okay? So I think you have this. Relevant experience. Then extracurricular. And then your part-time work. All right? Now, you have to have all of them to put it in that order, obviously. And if you don't, then I would stick to that order. I would put extracurricular and then part-time work, preferentially. And again, if you don't have extracurricular, then you jump to part-time work. But as I said at the start, the, more, the smaller those sections become, the less experience you have the more you might have to rely on quite a big skills section and move it actually right up to the top underneath education, okay? Because you need to keep the reader focused on why do you want to be an engineer? You know, what makes you an engineer? What makes you a lawyer, okay? So if I just go back to this quickly. We've got contact details, probably education, we're going to split this into relevant, and that's going to be three. 
That's going to be 4. That's going to be 5. Okay? And I'm going to put 6 here. And I'll come back to skills. All right, so that's your ideal order. Now, for your experience, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about extracurricular, voluntary work, or part-time work, or internship experience. The format should be the same. They might be in different sections. Okay, so you can have different section headings for each of those things. But how you're going to present the information for each position, each role, must be consistent all the way down the page. Okay, so dates go on the right-hand side, they line up, like I said, all the way down the document. What do you need to tell them? Who's the company or who's the organisation? If it's a UWE society, then that's the name of your organisation. What is your position? Okay? okay, and see how, again, I've bolded that bit at the top. And that's just, again, because on that first review, I'm not really going to get into all these bullet points. Okay? I'm just going to try to grab those key headlines. Okay? Now, in the bullet points, what should you be focusing on? It should all be action. All right? Every single bullet point should start with a verb. And because what you're trying to describe is what you did in the role. What you are not describing is what you feel you learned or how you feel you performed. Okay? You need to think about what you are actually doing in the role. Now, this is important because if you also have a skills section, you end up doubling up. You know, if you des describe skills and experience and you demonstrate your skills and skills, you're just going to end up with duplicate information all through the document. Okay? So, skills sections are for just stating what it is you bring. And this experience section is for stating what your responsibilities were. And like I said, everyone should start with a verb. Now, this is somewhere that you will get different advice. People will say, oh, don't focus so much on what you did. I want to know what you achieved. What was your outcome? Okay? And again, I don't disagree with that. But I think the notion that you could work for Shell for four weeks and, you know, substantially increase profitability is unrealistic. Okay? Focus on what you did first. Describe it well. And if that is a key outcome or a key achievement, you're given a team award for best team member, there was a policy document or a database that you're working on that continues to be used by the organisation, then yes, absolutely say that. Maybe make it the top bullet point or make it the bottom one and bold it so it jumps out. But your first priority is to describe what you did well. And people notoriously undersell themselves here, so they'll come to see me and they've written data analysis. And then when I talk to them about it, what they really did was, you know, they had to meet with people in the business, decide what data to use, gather that data, do the analysis, use a particular software package to do that, form some kind of recommendation based on the outcome of that analysis, and then maybe write a report or communicate it in person to a supervisor or in a room like this. But the point is that that is six or seven different skills that you're demonstrating. And you completely undersell yourself by just giving a small snapshot or phrase that, that's data analysis. So I always say to people, really challenge yourself. You know, when you got up in the morning and you went to your desk, who did you talk to? What meetings did you go to? What software packages did you use? What reports did you have to write? What presentations did you have to make? Okay? I never try to do both length and format at the same time as content. All right? If you try to do that, what will happen is you will leave out good content because you'll be in the back of your mind thinking, I've got to keep it to one page. Okay? And when people do that, they notoriously here start to summarize. And when they summarize, they tell you nothing. Okay? Making it short is not about telling me a little about a lot. It's about telling me a lot about what I care about. Okay? So it's about picking the information and being specific and giving me the detail. All right? So with everyone, what I would say is don't start by trying to make it one to two pages. Go away and write down all your experience. Exhaustively write these bullet points. And then for every job, go back to this experience and ask yourself, the position's probably going to go in. But what from these bullet points do I need to take? You don't need to take them all, all right? 
And even within these bullet points, you're going to make sure that you're thinking about what order should they go in. Most relevant should go at the top. It shouldn't be lost in the middle. All right? Last thing. If the document is too even, every single piece of experience has three bullet points, I don't know what you want me to look at. It's really uniform. Okay? Relevant experience should have four, five, six bullet points, depending on how long you were there. You know, if you were there much longer than that, it would be far more than that, but let's assume it's a normal internship. Okay? Part-time experience, waitressing, waitering, working in retail, they still demonstrate really strong transferable skills. They are important, but they should only have two to three bullet points. And if you've had multiple roles that are the same in casual employment, either just start dropping off the old ones or just make sure by the time you've written a two, you're only doing one bullet point for the rest. Okay? So you don't need to get into over-duplication. Don't feel like you have to say everything about everything. You're tailoring it to what they care about, making sure that you don't over-duplicate information. All right? Try to always tell them something new. Do you have a question? No? Um, okay. So like I said, this format all the way through extracurricular, voluntary, relevant. And when you do split up your experience, paid or unpaid is not the right question to ask yourself. It's just, is it relevant? Okay? Whether it was a paid internship or not, I don't really care. Okay? If it's relevant, it goes in that section. And then extracurricular and voluntary and part-time can go separate. All right? Okay, so let's just talk quickly about skills. Um, now, like I said, uh, my preference <laughs> would be, and I think this is, this is again where people get quick advice, and uh, I know when Woodside were here in particular, they've said, oh, we don't really care about skills. Okay? And that's all very well, assuming that everyone applying has something to say. <laughs> in the other sections. And so again, just make sure you get advice that's specific to your situation. Um, but the key thing with skills is just that um, they must be relevant to the job. Okay? They don't want to know every skill that you, they th that you think you have. Ideally, it will be a nice short two or three bullet points on page two because you'll have everything else. In which case, you're talking about programming languages that you maybe you can write in, laboratory equipment that you know how to use, Microsoft packages, and foreign languages that you speak. Right? Really basic stuff. The less you have of the other things, the, the bigger the section's going to get, and the more it's going to have to eke into transferable skills. Okay? So the more it's going to have to say things like analytical and problem-solving skills, strong, strong communication skills, interpersonal skills. Okay, so my challenge to you, <laughs> people hate this section, okay, and the reason they hate it is because people really don't like talking about themselves and saying, this is what I can do, this is what I'm good at, and they also haven't really taken time throughout their studies to think about what they've learned, all right? So I would say everyone should try to write 15 of these, okay? They're not going to go on the resume, necessarily, okay? But if you can go home and write 15 of these and exhaustively get all your experience down, then every time you come to make an application, you're going to go through your experience and ask yourself, what's relevant to this employer? What should it go in? What order should it go in to answer their questions most effectively? And once you've done that, then ask yourself where the gaps are. What have I not covered? Okay? From the job description. And then you go back to your skills and you go down your 15 skills and ask yourself, what from this do I need to put in? The other reason it's good is not only will save you time when you, have to, when you really get into kind of application season is when you go to a graduate event or you meet someone from industry or you go into the interview process or assessment centres, you'll be far better equipped to talk about yourself because you have already thought about what it is that you can do and what you bring. Okay? Now, 15. They should be bullet points. Think technical and transferable, okay? So technical, what do I mean? I mean related to your profession, okay? So in law, that might be legal research or understanding of certain databases. In pharmacy or biomedical sciences or something, it might be lab techniques. In engineering, it might be using Mathematica or MATLAB. 
profession related, okay? Transferable, the things everybody asks for, interpersonal communication, <coughs> teamwork, leadership, okay? Now, people always come to me and they say, oh, it just sounds really naff to say strong communication skills. Doesn't everyone just say that? Well, yeah, <laughs> they do. Um, but the way I think you can make it better, okay, rather than saying strong communication skills, I mean, communication is a broad church, right? Do I have this in here? I don't think I do. No. So communication is a broad church. It could be doing workshops or presenting, it can be interpersonal skills, it can even bring in teamwork, it can be managing expectations or liaising with different stakeholders, it can be customer and client service, okay? It's not any one thing and that doesn't even touch on actually written communication skills, okay? And one person is not necessarily good at all of them and one job does not necessarily require them all. So rather than say strong communication skills, Try to break it out, you know, do you have experience managing multiple stakeholders? Do you have experience in public speaking? Do you have experience in customer service or client-facing roles? And that's what you should be saying, okay? And when you come to do a skills section for a specific application, and if you need to use some of these, then you should be thinking, how will I be using that skill, like communication, in that environment? And try to write the skill in a way that's actually going to resonate with them. Okay, no point in saying public speaking if it's not part of the job, but there is part, p point in saying, you know, you've got experience doing written reports or publishable material if that's a huge part of the job. Okay, so don't demonstrate it, and this is important, demonstration is in your experience. Don't demonstrate the skill, but do try to specifically describe the skill. Okay, so try to do 15 technical, transferable, and then you know, the extras like languages. And languages in Microsoft Office, whether they ask for it or not, I would just always put on, and if, you, if it's a page two piece of information, then yeah, it just goes a couple of bullet points. Okay, at the bottom. All right. Okay, any questions? Yeah? No, okay. Okay. I'm going to come back to profile at the end because um, I don't think it'll apply to very many people in the room and we'll just talk a little bit about cover letters. Um, just before I go on, just that extra section that I mentioned. <coughs> All of these, okay? If you're an engineer, then your membership of Engineers Australia should definitely be on there somewhere, but it's page two information. If you've done publications and you want to apply to academic, um, like PhDs or postdoctoral positions, then obviously publications are page one information. But if it's now to go into industry, fine, put it on, but it's page two information. Awards we've talked about, okay, keep it next to the thing that it relates to unless you've got three, four, five things to say, in which case it gets its own section on page one. Okay, and then these two, again, like I said, are just, do you have to really look to these to demonstrate some experience because you don't have anything else, okay? Right, cover letters. So um, this is changing a little bit. I mean, I noticed in the vacation rounds in the last few weeks, a lot of people didn't ask for cover letters this time. And that's because they've spent so much money on their own internal recruitment processes and deciding what questions to ask and what to do at assessment centre that they really preferentially are looking to their own assessments rather than these kind of more generic documents. But if it doesn't say, it. if it's either silent or asks for a cover letter, then I would always do one, okay? Uh, cover letters should be one page and no more. Now, government jobs obviously actually ask you to specifically address selection criteria, but I would always do it in a separate document, okay? So the cover letter does not become, please find below my selection criteria, boom, selection criteria, and then please find attached, okay? It, has, it is a standalone document in its own right. It should look like a cover letter, okay? It must address all job requirements and this, I can't stress this enough, you must tailor it to the company, okay? So what we've been through, what I'm encouraging you to do is really ask yourself what experience have you had, do an exhaustive list. Ask yourself what skills you have, do an exhaustive list. And now we're saying, Look at the companies you want to apply for and really do your research and ask yourself, 
What do they care about? What are their corporate values? Um, what are they offering? Do they offer mentoring programs? Do they invest in professional qualifications? Okay. You need to be very clued up on what is on offer to you when you go beyond, both in the cover letter, but then when you go beyond that to the next steps in the process. Okay, so homework um, on the company is really paramount. All right? Yeah. So uh, the document that I will send you if you're signed in, if you're registered, is a... Uh, basically just a word document. It's really, it's really plain and simple, but it gives you this format and it goes through what should go in each of these sections. Now, I have sized these paragraphs consciously, okay? Um, really try to keep it nice and even. I know it sounds like it shouldn't matter, but the first impression is always, how do I feel when I pick up the document? And if I pick something up and it's got a huge single paragraph in the middle of the page, immediately I feel like, oh, that's going to take me ages to read. It's going to be really hard to read. And I'm immediately feeling negative. Okay? So these things matter. Um, I've got five paragraphs. And the reason I say this is not because it must be five, but because pe people generally hate blank pieces of paper. Okay? That's your enemy. So this is a structure to get you started. Okay, it doesn't mean the absolute final document must look like this, but this will get you started. So top and bottom is dead easy. Top should always say, I'm writing to apply for whatever. Okay, keep it simple. Why are you writing and who are you? I'm currently studying or in my penultimate year of whatever. Okay, right at the bottom, dead easy. Please find attached my resume. Thank you for taking the time to review my application or consider my application. I look forward to hearing from you. All right, again, nice and simple. Don't reiterate your contact details. They're at the top and they're on your resume and they're probably in some other field that you've had to fill in, all right? If you don't know the person's name, I always use Sir Madam, but HR recruitment manager, whatever, is fine. But dear, I think, is important salutation unless they've asked for something else. But if you don't know the name, it must be yours faithfully. And if you do know the name, it's yours sincerely. And it sounds like small things, and I don't want to give you too many anecdotes, so we'll be here all day. But I have known people in senior roles when they've had to review applications where they just can't pick between good candidates. I mean, there are a lot of people in the market who have good degrees, good extracurricular, good part-time work, good internships, interview well, and you just don't have enough spots for them. And it comes down to pedantic stuff. Right? So don't miss out because of grammar, spelling, or making silly mistakes. That just makes you appear unprofessional. All right? So the middle paragraphs are the most important bit. Two chunky paragraphs right in the middle. Why should they employ you? Okay? Lots of people want to first of all say, this is all the reasons why I want to work for you. This is how awesome you are. Okay? And that, there is a place for that on the cover letter. Um, but you, there's two things you must be careful of. I should not be halfway down the page and still know nothing about you. Okay? You shouldn't be telling me so much about my own company that I'm you know, almost at the end and I'm still waiting to find out you know, anything about you. And the second thing is, it shouldn't be information for information's sake. Okay? You learn about the company and you articulate what you know about the company in the context of why you want to work there. So you choose values... Maybe there are corporate values on their website, but you articulate how they resonate with you. How do they link up to your community involvement? You look at what they're offering. And for me, when I started at Deloitte, it was an easy one. You know, I wanted to work internationally. I wanted to do my chartered accountancy. They had that on offer, right? If your goals and what they offer are aligned, then, you know, by default, you're more motivated to work there over a longer period of time. Okay, so you're both, so you're talking about the company in the context of this is why I'm motivated. You're not just randomly telling me how big I am and what my revenue is. Okay, and actually there was an article recently with the H HR um, head of Goldman Sachs in the US where she said, stop telling me about my company. I know all about my company. Okay, I want to know about you. And that applies when people talk about career summaries and things and they say, I want to know what you can do for me, okay? That doesn't mean don't tell me why you want to work for me or what I can do for you, but tell me in the context of why you're motivated, why it means you're the right employee, okay? So two chunky paragraphs right in the middle. 
stay focused on what they've asked for. Too often, particularly good candidates who have done a lot come with a cover letter where they've thought, these are all the things I want to tell them. And then they've tried to...